Welcome back, warriors. Quayne Deloisi, Pam Palmeter, and I'm the host of this podcast, The Warrior Life. We cover everything from native sovereignty, treaties, and land back to decolonization, reconciliation, and how to support the struggle. So if you're interested in hearing from native peoples from sovereign nations all over Turtle Island, talk about their experiences on the front lines of Indigenous resistance, resurgence, and revitalization, then this is the podcast for you. Today's podcast is with a phenomenal Indigenous woman who is literally blazing trails in a hundred different directions. I can hardly keep up with her. So make sure you stay tuned so you can hear more about her amazing work. Welcome to the Warrior Life Podcast. This is the very first Warrior Life Podcast of 2023, and I am so honored and excited to be able to talk to Dr. Celeste Pedri Spade. Celeste is truly blazing trails in, like I said, a hundred different directions. So make sure you stay tuned to the whole podcast because you're not going to want to miss any single bit of this. But before we get into it, welcome to the show, Dr. Celeste. Miigwech, Pam. Um, it's just an honor to be here. I'm happy. Oh, that's awesome. I like I'm such a fan of your work. And sometimes I find it really hard doing podcasts when I'm such a fan of the people that I talk to, because then I get all like forgetting what I want to say, uh, too excited, making mistakes. But you're one of those people whose work is so diverse and so cool and so important that I had to have you on this podcast. And for anyone who hasn't met Celeste yet, she is doing so many important things. I don't even know how she had five minutes to come on this podcast, but I'm really, really excited about it. But before we get into it, Celeste, I'd like to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself and where you're from in the way that you like to. Miigwech, mm, miigwech. Uh, my name is Celeste Pedri Spade. I'm from uh, Nizatikung Place of Poplars, otherwise known as Lactamalak First Nation. Uh, I am a mom uh, of uh, three beautiful boys, Ginyu, Gijek, and Wakia. And I'm also a mother to a beautiful daughter whose birthday it is today, Emmy Gwewen. Uh, and it's her birthday. Her name means gift uh, in Anishinaabe one or the person who brings the gift. So, um, wow. you know, again, it's just a really big honor to be here. And I think, you know, that uh, like many Native women, Pam included, we wear many different hats um, in the work that we do in both uh, our family life and in our professional life. So, yeah. Well, thank you. And I know this isn't going to air today. This will air on Friday. But make sure your daughter listens because happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday. You couldn't get a better gift mm -hmm. than a daughter or a son, just kids in general. So what an appropriate name. And I hope she has the best birthday ever. And hello, happy birthday. <laughs> um, okay, so Celeste, there's, I, I mean, there's literally so much that I want to ask you about. I feel like I always feel like the lawyer in me is like a t interrogating people because I have a thousand questions, but I will try to whittle it down to just a few. But before we get into what you're doing currently, I'd yeah. love to know what your path was. What was your educational path and your artistic path? Because yeah. they seem very different, but also now kind of related. Yeah, I'm. I mean, I probably didn't take like I guess the traditional academic path um I didn't always know that I wanted to be in academia uh, I'm from northwestern Ontario uh, born and raised um I started I actually have an honors bachelor of commerce degree um and uh, I studied marketing uh early like that was sort of you know what I did as in, a, in my undergrad 
And, you know, my first, you know, full-time big person job, uh, professional job was actually working in um, some of our, like working in, in a big native uh, political territorial organization in Northwestern Ontario. And I worked in um, media and I worked in communications. Uh, and, you know, I, I did that, um, you know, working for thinking, you know, that that was going to be, you know, my career path was working in native politics. And um, I then, you know, moved and I also did that work for a very big uh, native service provider um, where some of my cousins still work in, in, in Thunder Bay. Uh, and it was in this, you know, this role that I was, I was already working as a um, communications manager where I, I decided that I wanted to pursue graduate level uh, education. And, you know, I, I wasn't in a position that, you know, I was in a position where I wanted to work still and go to school uh, and not, and, and there's very limited options in, in Northwestern Ontario to do that. So I, I searched for a, a kind of graduate program that I could, they wouldn't have to give up my full-time job because I wasn't in the position to give up a full-time job to go study uh, my master's. And so I, I did my master's in uh, culture and communication uh, at Royal Roads University because it was a, uh, because of the, the modality, like the way that it was able, like we were able to kind of go take some time off work, go um, and learn. And, and it was there that I think I really learned about like what research was and like how to think about it and, and really, um, Think about the link between like right away like research and creativity and culture and, and communication and and I, I was lucky to learn from folks at that time that were really exploring how we um, produce um, knowledge even though it was an indigenous program it was really about producing knowledges that looked and felt differently and that really resonated with me because I wanted to do something obviously that was related to my graduate work related to my culture uh, as an Anishinaabe Kwe, as an Ojibwe woman. And, and so I did work, I actually produced a, a film on our, um, the importance of uh, our, our songs in Anishinaabe culture. And, you know, from there, it really, it sh I, I really had that, uh, I guess, like, that love of, of, of learning and the love of of integrating art and knowledge and because it's so like that is our way like our knowledges mm -hmm. are so like they exist beyond like the, the paper right or the page and so um you know I went back to work and you know I did my graduate work and then I decided that you know I was gonna I loved it and I wanted to continue and so I applied for a PhD program and you know I didn't look back you know that I had to make a big change. Like we're literally my partner and I, we packed up our old Honda CRV, drove oh. all the way from um, from Thunder Bay, Ontario to uh, Victoria, where I did my 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 PhD. And you know, I've been in academia, um, you know, ever since then. That's that's a phenomenal journey. I mean, you see about that in the movies, you know, where people pack up everything and move and hope everything works out. It clearly yeah. did. Yeah. But what an adventure, too. I mean, with all the difficulties and challenges we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What an adventure. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I was really privileged to, like, be hired um, before I finished my PhD, you know, which was great because I had two kids um, by then. And I, I started my career at Laurentian University. In northeastern Ontario, which was great because it was well, it was still a twelve-hour drive from where I was from. It was still within my home territory, and I met many amazing, wonderful colleagues who are still friends and colleagues today. Um, you know, and uh, you know, it, working in the north of Ontario, it's it's um, you know, it, it's different than working in a in a larger uh, urban city or urban space, right, or at a larger institution, and you really have that community. Um, feel in in mm -hmm. in the work that you do within the institution and yeah then I then I um you know I I, I moved on from there uh, I was at Queen's University for a couple of years as the Queen's National Scholar in Indigenous Studies and then I just you know I decided that you know I needed a change and that my family needed a different perhaps a different place to to be at in the in the winter time and so I accepted the position that I'm in right now which is 
the uh, Associate Provost of Indigenous Initiatives. It's the inaugural position at McGill University. And so um, it's taking my, you know, me from that sort of research and teaching to more uh, administration, but I really, um, I, I've always been and written and about and very been passionate about the work that we need to do within universities to better support Indigenous students and, and uh, Indigenous educators. Well, congratulations on that job, by the way. That's what I mean about blazing trails. You know, you're the first here, you're doing this over there, you're just accomplishing all of these amazing things. I mean, I think university education is an accomplishment, working in communities accomplishment, working for our organizations, having children and raising children. I mean, that's one of the most important things that we can do as warrior women. And so you're doing all of these things. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, like when I heard that you were going to be the associate provost of Indigenous initiatives at McGill University, wow, that's mouthful. Yeah. Um, I thought, wow, yes, this is someone who is going to address real issues that actual Native people deal with in university institutions all the time. I mean, it's it's a place, it's generally good pay, you get to do good work, you get to, you know, combine your research with community and students, like, so there's so many positives to it. But then there's just so many challenges and barriers for us, even within Indigenous initiatives. And I'm wondering, you know, if if you've already encountered that, like for the rest of us, you know, we're still struggling with to get our institutions to deal with pretendianism, for example, or just tokenism at our universities, not making real change. Have you had a chance yet to think about that? You know, I, I've thought a lot about it, uh, you know, because, you know, I was the first person in my community to receive a PhD, um, I, you know, and I've come from a family that really, um, I think, understands the value, but also the challenges of, of post-secondary education. You know, I, I have cousins who are uh, lawyers, like, you know, uh, have lead or, or have their master's in social work and lead, you know, important social services and programs for communities. You know, my mother received a university level education. But, you know, um, we have so far to go. Um, I always think about, you know, when we think about an Indigenous community, like internal to a university, I'm always like looking at it and thinking about, you know, obviously the Indigenous experience is not a homogenous one across um, Canada, right? Um, we are diverse based on race, based on gender, based on socioeconomic status. And I think that when we talk about advancing Indigenization, like it, it, in, a, in a space, you know, at, at any university, I often think, does this reflect the diversity of, indigenous experience and the way that we see and we do things out here and and does it also you know um create opportunities where there's real um you know it's not it's not just enough to add indigenous knowledges and pe and the peoples attached to those knowledges to a university is is you have to really think about the spaces that are you know the structures in the system and if they're willing to mold and change to ensure that the, the, that that you know those people and their knowledges are respected and looked after and do they have what they need to to thrive right so it's that it's not just you know uh, sometimes your work is 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 not just about adding things or people right it's about it's about working with the existing you know structures and systems to change them so that what what is there can succeed right so those are just two things that I wanted, you know, I, I think that really all, often guide my work, right? Mm -hmm. And it's so important when you think about it. I mean, how many times have we all had conversations with human resources or leaders in different institutions and saying, it's not just about recruiting Indigenous peoples. What are you doing to retain them? Yeah. It's not just about having Indigenous peoples work in your institution. How is your institution changing? to address, you know, the plethora of Indigenous rights and perspectives and, and how are you engaging in a, you know, respectful way versus just making money from students and that's the number one focus. There's just so many things that I don't know that all institutions have really put their mind to. 
Mm -hmm. No, and it is. It's like that shift, right? That it, of are are we just treating indigenous communities and their respective nations as another stakeholder that our university is responsible, you know, to and needs to consult with, right? Or are we really centering relations, good relations, and a spirit of good relations with mm -hmm. indigenous peoples, their na their communities, and their nations in the spirit of of, of truth and reconciliation? You know, that's that's very different, um, and I think. It's it's easier for to do the first, uh, mm -hmm. and that's probably the model that that most universities know of. Um, it's a lot more challenging, and it takes time, um, and it takes a lot of of, of change. Trans it takes you know a lot of transformative change to I think work towards the second. So, um, but you know we're really you know I've I've always thought about you know in in now being in a leadership role myself you know. Um, the the importance of creating so many like of other opportunities particularly for other native women to be in um like leadership roles and in and, and, and roles where they're able to inform decisions is something that i'm very always been very passionate about and you'll see that you'll see that in my track record for for my for graduate student supervision you know is is really about how do we uplift and and and, and uphold like especially like other you know the you know native women behind me right or yeah. the, the, still that they're beside me right like that they've come before i mean you know in that sense right that my work is always grounded and i i, I i'm always trying to think about those kinds of things and I guess that's another reason why I've been so drawn to your journey, your educational path, your leadership, like everything that you do, because you have such a focus on women, even when it's not even stated, you can see that you're trying to make spaces for other Indigenous women. Um, and it's important that we lift up all voices, obviously, but in the past, at least in an academic context, the, the few Native academics that were hired tended to be men. Yeah. Um, the few Native experts in the media tended to be men. The few that were working in like newspapers and magazines tended to be men. And it's taken a little while for Indigenous women to be given the same opportunity, even though they had the same expertise and community experience and education and all of those other things, whatever context it was, it's taken a while. Mm -hmm. So when people ask me, you know, to, to work with a community or to, you know, speak somewhere, I always say thank you for being intentional about including an Indigenous woman's voice because we have a lot of <laughs> making up to do for all the times when our voices weren't heard. So yes. I really like that about your work. Yeah, you know, and uh, you will see it in my artwork. Like I think it, it it's really about, um, you know, I'm always thinking about that, I think in, in my every like my my professional work, you know, the hat that I wear, um, you know, in at McGill or the hat that I'm wearing as an artist, um, you know, a research based artist, I'm always thinking about how to honor, you know, uh, and, and how to honor relate of my relationships with women in, in my own life, um, you know, my family, um, and and then what that what that means like to mm -hmm. other other women, um, what that means like you know, obviously, even in the in the work of it to engage and include, um, you know, and create opportunities for our women to be together. And I think, you know, it, it come I come by it honestly, because it's like, you know, for me, I, I feel that art and research has had that healing aspect. And it's like, if you want, I've used it as that opportunity and that tool to to relate and build good relations with with other native women because it, it's really easy to work alone like or to become like you know just compartmentalized or you're just doing your own thing and you you don't reach out um and so you know that for that it, you know it's part of my work is really just you know very you know it's selfish in that sense that it it, it it's that way that I, I i i need you know i need to connect with with strong women in my life um, you know, and I, I'm, I'm sure, you know, it's, and it's hard, right. Cause I, you know, I'm a mom mm -hmm. of, of, of four. Um, I'm not always at home in my community. I live there in the summertime, but you know, I'm, I'm apart from, uh, from, from my land and my home and my family. And so, you know, I, I really appreciate, um, you know, the time that I'm able to spend, um, through my work with other women. I've always found that at least for me personally, 
that women are so supportive in ways that you never see. So Native women behind the scenes, you know, you might see a Native woman advocate, you know, advocating for, you know, changes in legislation. Or you might see someone who's a land defender on the ground. I think what people don't see is how Indigenous women behind the scenes are trying to support us when we're having a hard day with our kids or yeah. when we're feeling really overwhelmed or when someone has done something horrible or we've suffered another loss in our community. You really really see the strength of women coming together to support one another because no matter how much we try to reach out you know to other women or say our community the work you do can be so all consuming that you just de facto end up feeling very alone and isolated kind of like um academic work like phd work you know the higher you get in graduate studies the more and more isolating it is because you're just so focused on your one practice so one of the things i appreciate most about native women is how they are the soft place to fall they are the honest voices the loving voices the okay well we're just going to brush ourselves and get right back up and do this because it's important work and i don't know where I would be if I hadn't had that. You know, I have eight sisters. So I've been very thankful from the time I was young to have all of that support from Native women. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and, and we have to do it. Like, I think I, I often think about that. You know, we talked about aunties in academia, yeah, yeah, yeah. academic aunties, and, and then you, but, you know, I often think, well, who looks after them? You know, like, yeah. you know, that, that and, and I, it's got to be like, like the importance of creating these these opportunities to come together, um, you know, and support one another is something that you know I think we we need to like it's part of our our care, right? Um, so yeah, I've often heard from you know like people on the front line, so Native women who are land defenders or water protectors or or being there to protect people, you know, and an advocate, they often say that sometimes the world only sees the people on the front lines as the warriors, but they're like, we couldn't do this if my sister wasn't babysitting my kids or my mother wasn't soothing me when I'm crying or, you know, my auntie wasn't fundraising, you know, to try to make money for the cause. Like it's really all of that. That's all warrior work, you know, even yeah. just raising happy, healthy kids so they can be part of the cause in the future is just so important. And, you know, so I'm so glad you're in a leadership position in academia because you're coming with all of that understanding, all of our experiences and the important role of women. Like we have you to look up to and to follow and get advice from. And then I also think, you know, although it's, integrated with your education and your current work, then there's also the artistic side, you know, that's, that can also be enjoyed independently of all that. And I'm, and I'm wondering, did you always want to be an artist or is that, did someone pique your interest in that later on? You know what? No, I, I, well, I, I think I was always uh, somebody who, who, who loved art. Um, you know, my my family, like many families, um, we were affected by, you know, ongoing forms of displacement, right? And, you know, we were impacted, um, my whole family was impacted by the 60s scoop, right? And so th there wasn't a time for me, like, you know, my, it, I think for me, um, you know, the last 20 something years of my life have been really witnessed and, and, and participating with my family in terms of that that work that you're you're picking your your family back together and you're piecing things back together and that's the story i think that a lot of families in our area have um and and, and elsewhere like outside of northwestern ontario and it became very clear to me um the role of of art in that healing in in, in that restorative and reparative work and it was something that was really private like because it, it's very like you know when you're a maker right sometimes you're you know lots of women who love to bead so you're doing it alone like in maybe you got your your favorite jam on or your you got your favorite show in the background but like you're you're doing a lot of that introspective work like thinking work and healing work alone but it's also a really awesome way to connect to other people like other makers and other women in your family who are doing the same thing right and and that was the case for me right that um it was part of my that 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 journey 
of of of, of piecing everything back together, right? And mm-hmm. and learning about my like family, you know, history. And I think we're all on journeys of learning. Like, you know, when you know there's certain things in um, you know, that we've been taught that we shouldn't be talking about in our families, right? Like, you know, that are now we do or we're proud about it, right? Or we we've we've reclaimed those kinds of things, right? Like that's all been, you know, part of that that's been part of I'm that generation, right? And and so, you know, for me, um it was that way to connect and and, and do that reparative and healing work with women in my own family, including my mom. And and uh, you know, who has gone on her own her healing journey, right? And so you know, it was really, um, art was that way to connect with her, to connect other women in my life, to connect our histories of, 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 of women that came before me, um, to um, also give back to people that I was, you know, um, getting to know through my research. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, and, and I just, you know, I've always, um, I just, I need to do it. You know, I, I I need to do it to stay well and to keep well. Um, and I, I have something I love that our my my whole family does. My husband's an artist. He's from AF mm-hmm. and it's First Nation. He does. He's probably better beater than I am. And mm-hmm. like I do more sewing these days. And you know, it's part of our 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 commitment to living well and to sharing that and creating a very different environment for like for our children to be to be around and, and have that. So it just now it's part of life, um, you know, doing art, uh, and it's great when you can connect your 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 life and the things you want to do to your research and your academic life. And so, you know, that's what I do. And and you know, I I've heard from so many artists. I try to include as many artists in this podcast because they're the ones creating the images that rally us around land back or water is life, you know, all of these kinds of powerful images, Mm -hmm. but they also are the ones, you know, strengthening the connection or reconnecting us to our traditional practices. You know, it wasn't just about beading. It was about building relationships and maintaining relationships with your family, like everything that you have described. But I also like how you say, like when you're doing it by yourself, so say you're not beading, you know, with your aunties, but when you're by yourself, it's also a way of connecting to your culture, your spirituality, your contemplation for yourself how you work out your own issues it's that time alone and the, the, i think all of these things work together to make us better and more whole and you think about whether it's beading or sewing or basket making or quill work or painting drawing like all of the things in which we do it's represents yeah. so much more. And the thing that used to bother me, like in university, they would say, well, if you're going to be an artist, you got to focus on commodification. You've got to focus on a business. Can you make a business out of this? Because if not, maybe you shouldn't be doing art. And it was just a real lack of understanding about what art is. And the cool thing about you is that part of your art is also in fashion, you know, which makes it so cool in the images that you shared. And I'll make sure to post some of them on YouTube about like the regalia. It's, it's regalia, it's art, it's culture. And some of them are just so profoundly standing out. What, what connected you to the fashion part of things? Mm Hmm. Well, you know, it was starting out as in, in making regalia. So like oh. more sort of traditional, um, you know, my family dances and um, my mom has run a, a, a program out of from like Lac de Malac First Nation. She's the health director for my community uh, and run, has run a program called Sewing Spirits for many years now, over a decade and, and supporting other pe- community members in making regalia, but also other kinds of items that they like other kinds of skills and you know, whatever kind of items they want to, to make. Um, and so I definitely, you know, really that, that kind of work uh, comes, you know, and, and I've committed to that kind of work, but I, I think, you know, I it's about growth, personal growth and thinking about, you know, the indigenous fashion industry is such a, uh, a thriving, um, you know, you know, I want to call it industry, like it's a thri- thriving space, you know, where, where all sorts of people from different backgrounds are create creating and contributing 
such an like important um you know uh they're they're communicating knowledge like they're they're really showing us like this is the this is how we want to be seen this, these are the kinds of things that 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 we're that we are adorning ourselves with that show who we are who we want to be but also like our history now and our like connected to our present and our futures and i think like fashion in itself is such a great form of like self expression and like to put those ideas you know out in those visions out into the world for others to see and so i started to um you know i think you know i i sometimes i call some of the work i've done wearable art because you know you can see aspects of of, of the the garments that pay homage to and and relate to let's say you know ribbon work or or bead work you know or um some of our like you know the, in the materials themselves using bone or shells right but i often think and use the art to work through important ideas and concepts right that i'm trying to work through and process in my own but also at the same time to bring forward those kinds of histories and ex current day present day experiences that we should be thinking about and knowing like learning about uh, as both like in, both indigenous folks and non-indigenous folks and so um i always find that you you start with an idea you know of what you maybe want to make and a sketch but i think that it is the research part of me right that in doing and making you are engaging in a form of no, like knowledge production and you start to think about what it is you're doing and and then you stop and you think well i just you know or who you talk to and you learn you're constantly learning and you're constantly thinking and all of that goes into what you're making you know that that's that's totally held within that 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 you know the whatever it is that you 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 put together at the end of the day and even the materials they teach you those things because you know you want to do this but the material will not let you do that and so you got to change it right and you and in that changing your design or you're like oh you stand back and you look at it and you go like this is taking a different direction but maybe it's meant to and now i'm thinking about something else that i should be talking about and thinking about and i think that our ancestors like those that came before us that committed to that process of making they understood that there's only some forms like i always say we in 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 i think in many ways we love to privilege text and language in indigenous knowledges right and that's not to say that these aren't very important for like for for our indigenous knowledge systems but i'm the kind of person who comes in and says but what about the other kinds of of knowledges that can't be spoken or even heard right but or even like they have to be felt they have to be maybe they'll come into the world in an entirely different way you know in relation with our hands and our minds and our hearts and our you know listening and feeling and working right and and then we put those back out into the world and what do they mean right to our, to our people like you know to our as 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 distinct form of knowledge is right so you know i'm i'm kind of the person who wants to explore like what it is that we we learn through making well and the way your art like your wearable art i love that you call it that because it actually is wearable <laughs> and, yeah. and yeah. it is art and it's also tradition and culture and it's imagination and life experience like i really really like that concept and the fact that you know think about how far we've come in the old indian act days where you couldn't have regalia yeah. and people used to have to hide their regalia and then to today where i mean you were in indigenous fashion week in toronto you are exposing not just native people but people all over the fashion industry to the beauty and culture of native people and, and and some of those ribbon dresses and and the way you pair it with the different kinds of head uh headdresses that you have or the things that you wear on your head they're just they're so striking and phenomenal it draws people in to want to know more what about this what culture is this where What's the story behind? Who's the person who did this? And and I understand that in April you have coming up a a show. I think it's April twenty twenty three. It's a contact photography festival. What's that about? Um, so I'll have some of my pieces as as part of um, a, a sort of a separate show that has been um, some of my because some of my uh, maybe you'll see some of my work integrates. Um, materials and textiles with photography, 
Um, and so, and regalia too. Yeah. Uh, so I'm really happy to have some, some items as part of that, that particular festival. Mm -hmm. Well, people will definitely have to check it out. And then because shortly thereafter, in May of 2023, you're going to be doing something called Fashion yeah. Fictions at Vancouver Art Gallery. What yeah. is Fashion Fictions? Well, I'm really happy to have a piece that um, maybe people will get to see um, as part of that that show. Um, and it's called, um, the, the actual piece is called Anti-Pipeline Society Quay. And that was part of my material quay connection or sorry collection wow yeah. and that in itself was um sort of taking you know the past the present and the future in the future uh and trying to blend them together um and uh you know again it wasn't an, an i think uh a creativity like an exercise in creativity and 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 working um through um what does it what does it mean like as a maker um to weave together, like, you know, these past traditions in, in, in the present day and then thinking forward. Um, and when I made that particular piece, um, I wanted to make a really large ribbon, ribbon skirt. And that was, you know, to you know, ribbon skirts, um, you know, to some in, uh, Indigenous women and in some Indigenous communities are a symbol of strength and resilience. And that certainly like was how, how I've, um, you know, I do, I relate to them. Um, and I started to make this, you know, larger than life ribbon skirt. And then it sort of uh, evolved, you know, it was really simple, actually, like it was in the placement of the ribbons, as I was standing back from it, you know, wanting to make this really large ribbon skirt. And I, I where I placed them was there was a large, um, sort of um, a black, the black ended up in the middle, uh, sort of the mirror image of the ribbons. And that black line, um, you know, and it was when I was actually making it, this was not long after Standing Rock, right? And and this black line just cut through the, the skirt, like so, like just, it wasn't, I didn't really think it would do that, but it just cut through that skirt. And then it was on this bodice and it was like cutting through this, this you know, um, you know, it was like cutting through our people, right? And, and, but yet it was this beautiful, like I, you know, it was aesthetically pleasing and beautiful, like this big skirt. But I, I used to then I thought about like the concept of like, you know, regalia, right? And and in many nations we have all we all have our own different kinds of regalia. And in part, regalia um it, it at times uh, identifies, um, is a is a useful way of identifying members of our community that have been recognized uh, as being part of of a collective, like whether it be a society or you know, some other kind of um, group that is recognized and that in that item they wear, right? It, it, it shows the rest of the community and the nation that that person is part of that particular society or that particular group, right? And so I was thinking about like, hey, you know, what about all these women? Like you, we, we've talked about, right, Pam, like these women, these indigenous women who are on the front lines right now, right? And they were right at Standing Rock and and and, and they're, they continue to be in Wet'suwet'en, like, right? Like I was thinking, you know, you know, 300 years from now, 200 years from now, what are we going to record? Like, will be, there be the society that we, we, we recognize these women that stand on the front lines, right? Just have we, we've historically, right, recognized our warrior societies through material items, right? And so I'm like, hey, you know, maybe this is going to be, you know, like, this is the vision of what regalia would look like for those, you know, 300 years from now. Yeah. Where women to recognize the, these women, you know, that stood on the front lines, right? You know, and, and I say that humbly, like not standing, not being there, right? Myself, right? But like, will this be that, like, will we be thinking about this, you know, still 200 years, 300 years from now? And so I called it anti-pipeline society, Quay, you know, because of thinking about um, recognizing, you know, how many hundred years from now, the, the society, a society of women mm -hmm. who, who stood on the front lines to protect their homelands and home waters. That's so powerful because think about, and I mean, I don't have to tell you this, think about how if most of our history was erased, but when we were even talked about, it was always talked about in such belittled terms. Like we weren't these, you know, powerful, amazing, beautiful nations that we were and cultures. 
And even the law has tried to historicize us. So yeah. to be Mi'kmaq, well, you have to look back to the year 1500 and whatever you were doing then, like your culture, your life experiences, everything freezes right there. What I like is that you're busting through all of that that they've done to us and you have incorporated a lived experience, our hopes and dreams, our challenges, our resistance in that one skirt, you know, or that one whole regalia that you did. So to show that we actually are living cultures, we are living nations, and this is part of it. And someone 200 years from now is going to look at that and say, yeah, that's what was happening. And look at how we succeeded. And then they will make their own regalia with all of those, you know, challenges and celebrations. And I think that's what's so beautiful about your work because it's fashion so it's cool it's regalia so it's culture and you can connect to it but it's also our story our collective mm -hmm. story where you can honor all of our resistance and just like art you know you think about artists who like we were talking about who make a water is life or you know the the black snake that is the pipeline and trying yeah. to resist against that someone in the future is going to look back at that art and say mm -hmm. you know this on? isn't yeah, this isn't frozen. This is all of our yeah. experiences. And it's just yeah. so amazing. I love the work that you do. And I guess I, the one question I have to ask, because I have so many youth that listen to this podcast, they always have questions like, I want to be an artist. I've been an artist my whole life, or my grandpa was, or my grandma was, and I just want to carry on the tradition. But I'm so worried that I can't incorporate that into my life as well as being able to support my family you know mm -hmm. they, the, the worries of artists for example what would you say to youth who are like I want to do what you're doing mm -hmm. I think you know one of the things like you know I always say you know you hear that often where a person a young person particularly says well I'm not really an artist no. but I do this right and it's like you are an artist right like you are you are keep um, look at the skill that you have and you'll never, nobody will be able to take that away from you. Like that's the fundament. Like, I think that's so, um, you know, to support that in young people, right. That they have a particular skill that no matter what, right. They'll be, they, they can do that. Right. They've learned that they learn that within their family often like within or within community and, and, and kinship that, there's a, there's a certain strength in that. Like, and I think it's like kind of the same strength that you get from learning how to hunt, right? Or like, you know, when my family does hunting and fishing. And I always think that the, the greatest skills we can pass along to our young people, like my own kids, in, you know, included, is like, how do they look after themselves? Like, can they look and are we doing the work to ensure they can look after themselves if like shit hits the fan, you know, like if like apart from these systems that we are in, right? Not to say that, you know, that there aren't things to, to be learned from these, you know, university systems but that they can be okay they'll be all right right if that the if if the, you know as long as the land is healthy like you know they're healthy and i think of making as a similar thing like that that there's skills right that you can learn with making and that will be help that that helps support you right in that like there are so many young women particularly and young men who make, um, you know, they're, they, they make a living they, or they have a side hustle or like whatever mm -hmm. by, you know, beading or making and sewing. And, you know, that's so empowering, right? Because that's like, the, they have control over that, right? And, and I feel like whatever we can do to support, like continue supporting that and like letting them know that's part of like, you know, that's sort of, our, that's our sovereignty, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, when we talk about that is that they're not, there's not, they, they will always have that. And I always think about that too, even my own self. Like I always joke with my husband. I'm like, well, if this gig doesn't work out, you know, <laughs> at least I can do this. You know, I can pump out, like I can, you know, I can beat earrings. I can make um, moccasins. I know how to sew ribbon skirts. I know how to make dresses. I know how to, you know, mm -hmm. I, and, and I can do it well. Right. And people want it. Right. And, and I feel that there's a kind of a strength in that because then you 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 can sit, stick to your convictions, right? Like when you know that there's something else for you, if this gig doesn't work out, right? Mm -hmm. you can be honest and more truthful in who you are and, and have those more courageous conversations that you need to have in places. So that is what I feel is so like strengthening about like art uh, for, for younger people because they won't be as... Uh, I feel that it will it'll give them that that sense of who, like who they are no matter what and and that you know that they'll be okay that they won't compromise 
yeah. those important um, values that we're trying to bring back, like that we're that we're supporting as Native people. I, I love your perspective on this. And, you know, as we wrap up, everything I've heard from you is, you know, art can be just for you personally. It can be for relationship building with your families. It can be done for your community or with your community or and or it could be part of a job and or it can be part of your work. Like it doesn't it doesn't have to be one thing, you know, no. and I I love that about you. Like there's just so many opportunities and you know, Celeste, I can't thank you enough for coming on this podcast and sharing all of these really positive experiences and positive advice for youth, because we all know we're dealing with a lot of difficult things. And I think it's important for the younger generation to hear, but look, there's so much beauty. You know, we can also turn inward for all of the beauty, all of the art, all of the culture and celebrate all of the people blazing trails who are, you know, making space for us. And I'm, I'm so thankful McGill has hired you because they have put you in the best place possible to help them make change as an institution, but also to help make space for all of the other Native people that want to work in these institutions and do what you're doing. So thank you so much for taking the time. Oh, and I mean, Gwetch Pam for inviting me. Yes, I, you know, I've always been, been such a big fan of the work that you're doing and creating these spaces, right? To bring your work and to bring the work, the work of others, you know, out to the public because, you know, academia can be such a, uh, a way that is disconnected from, from the people. And so this is, um, you know, hats off to you and, and me watch for, for um, sharing space with me. Well, Alan, and thank you also to all of the listeners for any of the things that we were talking about. You'll see I've been post, uh, I will post the links to her website, her socials, because on her website, you can see some of the striking, beautiful photos. And that's if you're listening, or you can check it out on YouTube. She was gracious enough to share some of her photos. So we'll post some of those so that you can really appreciate her art and, and follow her work in the future. And don't forget for everyone who's listening, always support Indigenous content creators, Indigenous artists, mm -hmm. Indigenous peoples on the front lines, whether it's financial donations, sharing all of their socials, you know, a teaching about it putting these podcasts in classrooms, like whatever way you can to support Indigenous peoples and support their calls to action, you've got to do it. Thank you so much. Till next time, keep living a warrior life. Walaliag. We'll